Queridos Vengadores y Vengadoras, les habla dentro de sus mentes Rafistar PR. Le invitamos a ser parte de nuestro programa, ya que esta noche se hará historia. Compartan este programa porque será inolvidable para todos ustedes, ya que entrevistaremos a los escritores y showrunners de la serie de los noventas, X-Men, Eric y Julia Leewood. Le avisamos que la entrevista será totalmente en inglés, así que podrán hacer sus preguntas de esta manera. Pero se les pide que no formulen preguntas sobre el tema de la serie próxima, X-Men 97, por motivos de confidencialidad. Dicho esto, que disfruten el programa y sean parte de la historia. Good evening, Geeky Nation. And welcome once again to this, your channel, Badassium Geek. And we appreciate your faithful tuning in and support of this, your pop culture channel. And this one speaking to you, Pika Ni. And with me from the channel Geeky Teacher 42 is... Geeky Sama, what's going on? What's up, Geeky? Thank you, thank you for being here tonight with us. Uh, Happy to be here. Super uh, amazing show, right? But here at Badassium Geek, we feel super happy to have you guys here with us. But remember to support us in all our social networks that will appear on the bottom of the screen. Subscribe and share with all your friends and family. And don't forget that on our YouTube platform, click on the notification bell to be notified of all our videos at the moment. And if you wish to contact us for interviews or to receive information, write to us to our email. And you can also follow me on my personal networks as Picani. And remember, here at Madasun Geek, we support the health entertainment, local talent, and Latin America talent, the geek culture, youth, family, and especially our children. And we just do it because we, because we only, only work, work for you. For you. It's right, it's right. So tonight on Badassium Geek, we, the participation of Geeky Teacher 42, AKA Geeky Sama, myself, 
Uh, we are honored to have a magnificent interview with some great people who were responsible for a great success in the 90s. That is correct, Geeky Sama. And if you want to know who we are talking about, well, I just tell you this. They are great talent where they have participated in pop culture projects for decades, which have also collaborated with production houses such as Hanna-Barbera, MGM, Disney, and many others more. But they are best known for one project in particular that started in the early 90s for the Marvel Comics franchise. What is it about? So let's see what we're talking about. Vengadores y Vengadoras. Today, we have the privilege of interviewing the writers and showrunners of the legendary animated series of the 90s, The X-Men. So without further ado, let's present to you from California, USA, Eric and Julia Leewald. Welcome, Eric and Julia, to Badassium Geek. And thank you for your time to be here with us tonight. It's, it's our pleasure. P P thank you. <laughs> exactly. And thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us. And we're so happy to have you here tonight with us, right? We're, and also with my friend, Kiki Sama, a fellow Silent. gamer. Oh, are you happy, guys? Are you excited? You know, thrilled, thrilled to talk about mm -hmm. X-Men, the animated series. Uh, to clarify, I uh, was a writer on the show, specific episodes for the series, uh, like Days of Future Past Part 1 in Season 1, and other episodes throughout the series run. Eric was what we call the showrunner. <laughs> every page of every script ran through your computer. You were in charge of every story and all the, all the writing, all the writing, all the stories. But the art was handled by um, Larry Houston and, and the incredibly talented folks on the art side. So yeah, we can't draw. Just just the story. Just the story. So, right. Yeah, but but that was um, back in uh, when you got the call in 1992. It's hard to remember 30 years ago, but X Men were not a household name. There had been no movies, and there would really the the TV. They hadn't been on TV much at all. So when we got the job, our the people at Fox said assume that the people watching the show on, uh, are won't know who the X-Men are, that eight out of 10 viewers it's good, won't know a mutant, won't know who these people, these characters are. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, 30 years later, um, it seems like everyone on the planet knows who the X-Men are. Well, it was a great team of production that worked here, great writers, great showrunners, great artists, you know, it really called the audience from the young ones, right? From my generation, especially. You were the target demographic. <laughs> <laughs> you got us. You got us yeah, big time. That is <laughs> yep. really good. Yep. A nice thing we learned as the show ran, because you all of us on the writing side were hired for 13 episodes. That's as far as they just, thought it would run. season one. One season, and they thought it was going to crash. But so uh, with that 13 episode, it was come up with 
come up with the biggest, strongest stories you can for what no one knows about. It's the X-Men. Give it your best shot. But uh, the surprising thing was in those in the running of those 13 episodes, the young folks were watching, but college students were turning in, parents were turning in, adults were turning in. The, the ratings were all over, which was a huge surprise in a good way. Yeah, yeah. They, they in Hollywood, they all very often tell you just make a, a TV show very small audience, say age six to nine, or or for preschool. Or, mm -hmm. And we were very uh, lucky that when the stories we wrote, very young children could enjoy them, even if they didn't understand everything was going on. But the everybody could sit and 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 watch them together as a family, and that. And that helped make it such a success. It was. It didn't. It didn't seem too young uh, for the older audiences. They're universal. Like, sorry, they're Thank universal you. stories. They're universal stories, and they were. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you did an amazing job at portraying those, and it was very different seeing them as a child and then seeing them as a younger adult. Uh, there was so much that I would catch on, uh, um, with a more mature mind and all. Um, it's a testament of it's a testament to a pretty much superheroes on TV. I, I think okay. so many. I also us. think also that um, this animated series is a way for kids to reach um, those characters from the comics. That sometimes they couldn't get reached to get access of those comics and read it. So what better way for them to watch the comics on the TV and learn those stories? Yeah, TV was wonderful then. It, it, it spread out all across the world. We, we forget now how many people, in, they would, we'd get ratings for, say, all the TV sets in North America. And back then there were only three or four TV channels. Networks, big networks. Yeah, uh, and sometime, some Saturdays, half of North American TVs would be watching X-Men. You know, one out of two households that had TVs on be watching X-Men. Amazing. And then if you think about it, they sent it around the world too. They they exported it very well. They're very good at that, mm -hmm. uh, Fox was. And so we meet people from Egypt, from South America, from New Zealand, from Europe. Singapore. Singapore. We're, we're <laughs> in Singapore and the people helping us with the baggage the said, TSA oh, agent. we all love X-Men. So they saw her shirt and said, said, oh, you did X-Men. We grew up Many people we meet say they learn learn English watching X Men, and sometimes they get it in two languages. A friend from from uh, from Egypt said there was one one channel in Arabic and one channel in English, <laughs> so he could flip back and forth and improve his English. We had no idea the impact. Yeah, yeah. For, no idea. for us, we were just telling the best stories we could, just like on any other show we were hired for, mm -hmm. and then you know you move on to the next job. We did understand how much uh, we were connecting, how many people we were connecting to. So it's wonderful to find out. Yes, yes. All right. Uh, almost the ending of the show, we will give a chance for our fans to make their questions. So Vicky, tell the audience about the confidentiality agreements. Okay, so it should be noted that to all of our audience tonight that for reasons of confidentiality agreements by Marvel Studios and Disney, uh, Disney Plus Network, that in this program we cannot talk or ask uh, anything about X-Men 97 Project. <laughs> so we ask everybody in the chat room to avoid all of those kind of questions on that topic. But everything related to the original X-Men series in the 90s, you can ask everything and anything at the end of the interview. All right, thank you, Vicky. So, also, we want to ask our guests, Eric and Julia, to talk about their website so that our public can visit and find out about everything that you offer on your website. Yeah, yeah. On, on the website, uh, we have um, about 200 posts that are, say, stories about things that happened during the making of the show or say pictures of people that <laughs> that 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 helped that helped make the show that we wanted to give credit to 
uh, because sometimes in Hollywood, people don't get they don't get recognized for the work they do, uh, especially behind the scenes. Yeah. So, for instance, we put online we had a, one on Ron Wasserman who wrote that wonderful theme song, and in the credits, it doesn't even list him because no. he was just working at Saban as a as a composer, and wow. he didn't have it in his contract, I guess, to get listed. So other people got listed. We so want to give credit we want, when we can. Yeah, we want to make want to make things clearer or talk about you know, funny things that happened that almost <laughs> swamped, you know, knocked it off. There are, there were, yeah, that was, that was uh, Larry Houston there on there. That was the, the main in charge of the artists, the way mm -hmm. I was in charge of the, the writers. And next to him was Chris Claremont, who, when we wrote the, the, the show and looked back over 30 years of X-Men comics from 1963 to 1992, uh, most of the, favorite ones we liked were Chris Claremont's writing. He wrote for about 15 years on the on the books. And so it was one, we did not meet him during the making of the show. He's he's not an animation writer, he's a comic book writer, but he's, it was wonderful, as you saw from the picture. We've met him at a couple, at Comic Cons, which mm -hmm. are great fun and a great way to catch up with people. I'll say this, getting the chance to meet Chris Claremont and have that picture taken, I was nervous. I mentioned I got to be one of the, the three writers who worked on Days of Future Past, parts one and two, for the first season of X-Men, which basically ended up kind of being a reimagining of one of the crown jewels in the X-Men stories. And, and Chris Claremont is the genius who crafted that. Going up to a con, introducing myself and saying, I, I hope it's okay. I, you know, I, 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 it's an honor to meet you. And I had a previous on X-Men hat. I said, would could I give this to you? And he goes, yeah, I, I am previously on X-Men. <laughs> and so he's been wearing it at all the cons he attends. So he was very he, gracious, to us, he very was. kind. Yeah. So. All right. So having said that, so how about we start with tonight's interview? And remember everyone in the audience, please ask your questions related to the specific night of series at the end of the interview, all right? Thank you, my people. So let's start with this amazing interview to Eric and Julia Lewall. So let's start with the first question tonight, right? So Eric and Julia, tell us about yourselves and your career trajectory and success. When did your career begin and which was your first project? One of those overnight success stories that took 10 years. <laughs> I grew up in Texas and went to college out at Texas Tech in Lubbock and assumed I'd stay in Texas and go to some kind of graduate program and something law or medicine, I didn't know, but I assumed I would stay in Texas. And in senior year college, a friend said, I'm moving to Los Angeles, I'm moving to California to teach student music. And they pay people to write in Los Angeles and you like to write, you want to come along? It never occurred to me to leave where I was and go to Los Angeles. But in that moment, I got to try. So with my family's blessing, loaded up my car, drove out to LA, didn't know a soul, decided when going to law school at Southwestern Law School, I would have some knowledge to fall back on if, if the writing career didn't work out. And for seven years after that, it wasn't working out, but you know, bit by bit by bit, and the first, doing small little side jobs, got an opportunity to pitch at the Disney afternoon, which was ramping up with then Chip and Dale's Rescue Rangers. And the first, it, it took me six months to come up with a pitch that they liked, but they bought it. And then they asked me to write the outline, then write the script, and then said, we have an empty desk here. Would you like to join our staff? <laughs> yes! And became a member of the Disney team then. And three years later, entered the freelance market and been working with him. My desk is over there for, for years. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah she, she grew up in Texas. I, I grew up in Tennessee and loved, loved movies and uh, uh, dreamed about coming out here and uh, 
made little try to work on little independent movies when in my early 20s which is a, a way to spend the year and earn no money and uh get experience but i uh when i came out here um i wasn't sure what i you know how to break in how it, hollywood's a very strange place there was it, no internet there yeah was no yeah there was there was the no way to google anything or find out who, who was hiring and where or how and it just happened but i've been writing for years and years and years script and script and script and so one day in 1984 uh my neighbor who worked at hanna barbera said oh we just got a bunch of uh new orders for shows my boss says she, she'll look at new writers Do you have anything i can show her so yeah sure <laughs> <laughs> and but in doing that a friend of mine from tennessee and i got one got one assignment and from that one assignment 25 years straight work it just that was the that was the opening of the door and he didn't have an animated script for i didn't them to read no, but he had a bunch of other scripts yeah so they they knew that they knew not everyone dreams of writing animation or has has the experience so they were just they were looking they needed more that's the way it happens out here. Great deal. Not what you need. If, if they need some people, you may get a chance. And so they did for Hanna Barbera for me. Then three years later, Disney got a big order and they needed new people. So there was a door open for Julia. And as you probably look, saw looking on our list, we've each worked on 45 different shows yeah, over the years. Great. You just, it becomes, uh, it's it's our normal job so it doesn't seem extraordinary but you know you work on something for a couple months or maybe six months and then you shake hands and goodbye it was wonderful and then you work for the different company and you move on and whoever whoever needs you and mm -hmm. so it's kind of a uh, a gypsy existence <laughs> uh it was very nice we had three years at disney where we were just there on staff without, was, without moving he was in the office next door the yeah. <laughs> yeah so we had offices next door that's how that's how that's we really met so uh it was a wonderful place to to work and to learn more about how you know how to do this how to do this well and if uh X-Men happened a little over a year after we both left Disney. Uh, and it, you, it, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in here, but you were in the freelance universe. You got um, uh, invited yeah. to work on the, the, sec, the new season of uh, Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice, which had just moved to Fox Kids. And Fox Kids right. was the brand new Upstart Network. And I knew someone there I worked with before, and he said, we, he said we need you to help us for a few months on this. So that was great, it was done. And that's how I had no idea that X-Men was coming. I didn't know the X-Men comic books, really. Um, I mean, I knew the name, but I didn't know who they were. Yeah. And so he called me the night before a big meeting and said, uh, you know, we'd really like you to come and, and, and run the show for us. We just like the way you wrote on Beetlejuice. So come on, do this. Okay, and I had to just, I'm going to keep my mouth shut at the meeting with Dan Lee and everyone because they all knew X-Men backwards and forwards and I didn't and I was going to be the one doing in charge of the writing so <laughs> I had to learn very 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 fast and quietly <laughs> amazing, amazing. that sounds great okay, so let's go to the next question Vicky yes uh so now entering the context that um, the, the, the thing that we're here for, uh, tell us, uh, how is it that your great adventure begins uh, with this amazing project, the X-Men series of the 90s? Oh, how, how did we begin in it? Or, or, or... Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. She, yeah, she, she was obviously, uh, I, the, the, the people at Fox, who made this happen? The woman who had just been made the president of Fox, Margaret Lesh. Her name. She deserves all the credit. She, all in the, the world. credit. She she's been working 20 years in the business, worked for Marvel Productions for a long time, and surprisingly, this is so odd to think back. Surprisingly, all through the 1980s, she would go to the television networks and say, 
X Men would be a great show. Produce, play Marvel shows, please. We can make them. And all the people at the network said, "Oh, nobody's going to watch some superheroes. That's oh, they, they don't know who they are. They don't know who they are. That's just a few, you know, only a few people read comic books." Margaret, be quiet. Stop pushing this. So finally, she gets made president of a network, a kids' network, and says, "Okay, now." First show, we're two shows we're going to do are X Men and Batman. So boom, okay, we're gonna, so it's her doing, and her right hand man, her enforcer, her, <laughs> her 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 best assistant, Sydney Eyewater. Uh, I had worked with him for about a year be- years before, mm-hmm. and so he knew me. And so as soon as uh, Fox Network got started up, he had me come over. And do a script for him for Beatles. That's how I got the Beetlejuice shot was right. because of Sydney. Mm-hmm. And so that way Margaret got to know me. And then when it came time for her to decide who would be the head of the writing, you know, she and Sydney just agreed, okay, Eric fits. He's the right tool for the job, maybe. Now realize Beetlejuice is not the same tone as as X Men, but you know, again, it's also the relationship and the and the quality of the writing. And for the record, when you were tapped by Sydney to come on to a new project that we're going to have a big yeah, meeting yeah, for. Yeah, they lied about it. They kept it very secret, just like now with <laughs> X-Men 97, yeah. for about a month while I was waiting to see for this the show that oh, I was going no. to do. They wouldn't tell me what it was. They first lied to me and said it was Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Okay. So I said, all right, I, that'll, be, that'll, be, that'll be fun for five months. I can yeah. spend some time doing that I can write funny scripts and that will be a great you know it'll pay it'll pay because we have a baby and we've got we've got, we've, got a, we've got house payments so yes color tomatoes fine Sydney okay I'm I I won't go to another place I'm ready and then re- literally the night before he calls up and said it's not I we were lying to you it's not <laughs> killer it's it's a Marvel property it's a big one it's called X-Men and I'll see you in the morning so Hunter? so they they kept it from the art, from the artists too. They kept, they just kept it very very quiet. I guess Marvel loves secrecy, but they kept it quiet <laughs> about what the show was going to be. So, I guess expectations wouldn't get up. But you walked into that meeting, and Stan Lee is there at yeah. this meeting. What's very intimidating? And we all have to dis- discuss about what is best for the show. And so we just we were very careful. What you we were said. very careful. I wasn't there. I got, but I was there when you came home. <laughs> Crazy. So you and your your best friend. Yeah, my best friend from college, Mark Edens, wonderful writer. Uh, from Tennessee, came out yeah. also. Uh, we sat down at our dining room <laughs> table at our little little house. No offices. Yeah. And laid out the first season, uh, thirteen, and Mark wrote. The, the opening, the the pilot, the two part opening, uh, Night of the Sentinel. Mm-hmm. And then we, you know, spent six months with other other writers like Julia, getting the 13 first uh, episodes written. And then the thing with animation, with hand painted animation, it takes about four months for them to animate it and see back what you wrote. And it gets sent from the drawing boards here in Los Angeles overseas to be animated yeah. there, painted there. So we were done with all, with all the stories completely and were, were laid off in effect yeah. before we saw one second of animation back. <laughs> we heard the recordings and so we understood how wonderful the voices were, mm-hmm. but uh, we didn't really, we, you just have to have faith in animation that all that you'd imagine uh, is going to turn out as you imagined, or maybe better, uh, but is going to turn out well. So, uh, so we actually, all of us, were let go. We started working on other projects. Exo Squad for, for about about three months. We were working on other projects, you know, to pay the bills while we were waiting to see what they did with the X Men, you know, what the animators had done, if it was going to work out. Yeah, we didn't know. And that wow. it worked out well, and we, we they asked us back, and some of us could come back, some couldn't, but, um, but yeah, that was a strange time, having finished writing a whole season of yeah. this and not seen it yet. Well, amazing, that, amazing. that sounds magical. 
<laughs> like say, I, I, I might imagine that first moment of seeing all of that come into life. Yeah. is magical. To be honest, I love the Beetlejuice series. Oh, oh thank that you. Is, I'm a fan of Beetlejuice. Yes. I really love it. I used to watch that series. I also love the movie played by Michael Caton. Oh, it was really. I should not mention that one more time, Beetlejuice, because he will appear. Oh, it did. Now it's going to show up. Okay. Now it's going to show up. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to the next question, right? And in the X Men animated series, who is your favorite character? Any specific all... hero or villain? Or, oh. And which is your favorite episode and why? As a writer on the show, I'll say this. I I love Beast. He is the smartest person in the room. He is the most romantic. Gosh, he's he's bless him, he's damaged. You know, he, he can't he can't walk around the way every other member of the team can down the street without being, oh that that guy looks weird. That guy. I love Beast. And it was fun. Eric, you were the one who came up with the idea of his call to action would be some obscure poetry quote or some obscure line of literature. Um and then, and that became fun as a writer to sort of out challenge the other writers coming up with the most interesting, obscure quote for Beast to use when, you know, in an action scene. And then if we get around to villains, I'm going to say Apocalypse. I'll let you say why when we get to yeah. it, because there is a specific reason for why Apocalypse. we love Apocalypse oh so God. much. Okay. So Beast <laughs> and then Apocalypse. Yeah. And for me, um, since I was the supervisor, since I was over the course of five years, 20 different people wrote for, for X-Men. Julie was one of them. She was one of the best ones. I'll say, you know, wife. You are recording this, yeah. right? Okay. okay. Yeah. So but I had this whole group of very different writers to supervise and be kind of the father for. And so I had great sympathy for Professor Xavier. I mean, he had this group of very different, you know, uh, X-Men who were co constantly in conflict and, <laughs> You know, uh, so and had had to try to keep them all together and focused on the one job. So I, I Xavier was it's crazy. My because so many people, almost everybody loves Wolverine or they love Gambit, or if they're, they're women. Sometimes they love Rogue or Storm. Xavier, Xavier works uh, worked for me that way. Again, as the as a villain, you know, Magneto's wonderful, but oh. a, writing for Apocalypse was spectacular. This voice that he had. And that we could, that would just like fill the screen with this voice. Oh my God. And we didn't know, just by small chance, we both grew up watching the original Star Trek. That was my road into when, the world. When we were little children, that was a thing that blew our minds was, mm -hmm. what is this show? This, 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 this Star Trek show. So what we didn't know was the, the gentleman, the actor that did the voice of Apocalypse for us, was the very first Klingon on the Star Trek show in 1966, 67. Actor, we're going to pronounce his name wrong, but oh, John Colicos. John Colicos. John Colicos was the very first Klingon on the very first Star Trek. And then he was first. the Apocalypse. And he was the same voice, you know, I am the rock. You know, that, that, the that voice that and that guy was uh, so that was a connection. That was a oh. connection, special connection for Apocalypse. Wow. For me to have had anything to do with anything with someone who worked on the original Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. I love these, these epic lines. He's, what? It's Magic all lines. eyes on him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Same yeah. for Beast. Oh, oh. And you, said, you said favorite episodes. Oh, oh, episodes? Favorite episodes? Yeah. Ooh, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm, I'll, I'll go. The last season, season five, was was rough animatically, <laughs> a rough animation wise, because they just they cut, cut the, the budget. budget in half. There was no money for it. But but that last episode called Graduation Day, when Xavier is injured and needs to leave the planet. But in that episode, when he gets to have his moment with each of his X-Men and they get to have their moment with him, God, it 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 makes me tear up watching it every time. I, I love that episode. I love it. Yeah, there was a there was a story that Julia came up with, Beauty and the Beast, where Beast falls in love with the blind girl. Written by Stephanie Matheson. Written by another person. Job. Julia pitched the original idea. 
that was ex that was excellent and that I thought we could really we did more with Beast than we usually yeah. uh, allowed ourselves to do. But for me, the my favorite because I was responsible for coming up. It was the hardest part was coming up with story ideas. Once we had an idea, we had talented writers that could write a 35, 40 page script and we had confidence that they could. But you know, what 76 stories out of 20,000 <laughs> possible stories do, you, do we tell? And you know, which ones are important? Which ones are memorable? And so I'd go for weeks or months trying to decide what the next three or four stories were going to be so that we could get people working on them. And once in a while, one would just come to you that, oh, that's, that's, that's solid, that's good. And my favorite moment like that was one called uh, One Man's Worth. Two-parter. Two-parter in a, a, about, fourth, epi about episode 50. Yeah, fourth season. It's, uh, and it's the one where uh, Xavier, uh, someone goes back in time and kills Xavier in oh. college and changes the world so that suddenly there were never any X-Men. And, and it's an immediate... That's an that's an original episode, right? Yes. yes. That's not from and, the comics. And, that's an original episode. Yeah, yeah. And and that and and uh, so of course I stole from uh, "It's a Wonderful Life," you know, where the angel shows Jimmy Stewart what the world would be like without him, and he had never lived. City on the Edge or, of Forever from Star Trek. City on the Edge of Forever, <laughs> where it's about look what would happen if this woman lives or dies, mm -hmm. and it would change everything. So the basic simple idea was there. But to me, it was special because it, it highlighted well, what are the X-Men? Why are they? What's so special? Why do we care about them? Okay, here's a story that shows what would have happened if they hadn't been there. And that's why it, it, it touched me so much. And for Julia, it got to have, let uh, uh, Wolverine and Storm be married in the future, in the alternate future. Oh, awesome. In the whole series run, Wolverine has his she's, relationship she's, she's, they're wearing wedding rings that's the only episode that's the only two part where he's gonna they have wedding rings and they are so perfect as a couple in this alternate awful world that it's like no no don't change it don't change it <laughs> no because you're gonna break apart you're not gonna be together yeah. and as a writer in the in the current real world of x-men it's like oh darn it we should have made him a couple they're perfect together <laughs> but but and you're right eric uh, in pitching this, because you would pitch batches to the folks yes. in New York, in pitching this idea, they sparked to it. They loved it, and they ran with it, and 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 used a similar idea, used it as an inspiration for their huge, wonderful uh, group of books, Age of Apocalypse. And but the way animation and versus comic book, uh, they came out about the same time. But well, Larry Houston was able to use some of their original yeah. designs in your original story <laughs> it felt so good because we took so many of their story oh, please, we yeah. took so many of their wonderful story bits and mm -hmm. character moments and used them in our show from what they'd written in the books mm -hmm. it was nice to give back and have them feel excited about something original we'd written and yeah. that they built a wonderful book series up oh my god yeah so that it was, was nice, to, nice to give back isn't it, isn't it crazy looking back on yes. that yes yeah. And to be honest, I also thought that Storm and Wolverine would make a great team. Because when I saw that, well, they got the perfect uh, um, chemicals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's really amazing. It's really amazing. I really like it, like you say. Why doesn't Wolverine stay with Storm? Why doesn't he see her? Why doesn't he look at her? What a shame about the time change. Yes, yes. When they say goodbye, it was good, darling. It was the best tough guy. And they're hugging and they're, and they're oh, my God. <laughs> oh, heartbreaking. And and again, it was a Saturday morning kids cartoon. But this stuff, yeah, man, comes to the heart. heart. And, touches me. And as, as somebody said, but we even though we had all these very adult ideas and character moments and emotions in the show. We made sure that it was fast paced and colorful mm -hmm. and full of action and drama so that you know a four year old could enjoy watching it. And w w uh, even if he missed two thirds of what was going on, still have fun. Mm -hmm. So we tried to make it all fun around it, but put, put the important things underneath. 
I, I like how you humanize the, humanize the characters, and they both have internal and external uh, uh, conflicts that we could relate. Um, um, I just thought that it was done masterfully. Oh, that's, that's thank so you. Fun. Thank you. Thank you for that. That means the world to hear that. Really appreciate that. All right. So, Vicky, what about uh -huh. we go with the next question? Yes. So, what inspired you to work hard to make these this animated series a reality? What challenges had to uh, you had when writing, when making this animated series uh, back in the how, how much time have you got? How many hours? <laughs> there were a lot of challenges. Yeah. Well, but uh, okay, Margaret Lesh, as the head of Fox Kids, deserves all the credit in the world for moving this thing forward and giving us as writers the edict, you don't write down to the audience. You think of this, it's not a one hour live action drama at night, but you write like it is. And suddenly we never, I never had that kind of freedom in an animated show for children to address problems, to address issues, to, 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 to write that way. There had always been, oh, you've got to be careful if you're writing for kids. But that, that was amazing. That that was an amazing um, edict, and it was master. It that changed everything. I think. Yeah, and many of the people involved in supporting the show, or um, or wondered if our idea for making it so adult and the story so challenging was a good idea. They were scared. I mean, if you have your money yeah. invested in something, and it's very different from what you've done in the previous ten years. And these people are just saying, no, you must understand, We people will enjoy this. The audience will enjoy this. And they're not used to that. They took a big risk. Yeah. We would get from various people pushback saying, can't you dumb it down? Can't you make it silly or make it funny or put a lot more humor into it? And we would go to Margaret, who was getting this pressure worse than we were because they were people that she was colleagues she was having to work with. And we'd say, no, Margaret, we believe in the way it is here. Can we fight for this? And can you at least just give us this first season? And every time there was a chance to change it, uh, she backed us up and said, no, you're just going to stay the way you guys want it. And in TV shows, there are dozens of times over the six months we work on it that something to go wrong or it could get pushed in the wrong direction or end up i mean literally it says in one of our books one of the suggestions was that it was just going to be xavier and an x-men in a van driving with cerebro driving around bumping into a new mutant each week but that was going to be the story I mean, people well-intended people had very different ideas of what the show was going to be so the biggest, all 90% of the big challenges were the first season getting people to believe that the direction we took it was going to be the right one. Once it was successful, once the fans showed us that they loved it, then everybody's fine. <laughs> then no problem. No challenge. You know, it's just a challenge to work hard and keep, keep the level high. But that's a wonderful challenge to just... To, to do but the first season was a lot of arguing and a lot of you know calling late at night saying please don't make us change this <laughs> you know and i want to give shout out and acknowledgement to another person who was key, key yeah. to the x-men success and that is and normally these people aren't but the woman at Fox Kids, who was the broadcast standards and practices person, the basically the censor, a woman named Avery Coburn, who who was familiar with the X Men books, and was willing to let X Men take the kind of chances it took in the animated series and be so adult because her word is law. Oh man! If she says we can't we can't ever see Wolverine's claws because that looks painful, we don't want to traumatize children with claws coming out of a hand then we would have never seen Wolverine's Claws. It would have just Correct. been end of discussion. We asked her if if we could kill more <laughs> in the first episode, have a heroic sacrifice in the first that episode. That was genius. That was yeah, genius. Like <laughs> and and I, I, Mark and I just looked at Julie and said, well, of course we have to do this. It's a heroic show. We need sacrifice. It's not gratuitous. It's and, and she just shook her head and said, 
this is never going to go on children's it's television. Never going to get no degree. chance. Ever. But luckily, Avery, this woman, understood, and she listened, and she had, she trusted us mm -hmm. that we wouldn't treat it gratuitously, that we would, and that we would do it right. And with her trust, we it happened. So again, you have. Of 20, 30, 40 important people in a project. And if that one person had been a different person, the show could have been terrible. Yeah. With the same everybody else. Yeah. Uh, we are so glad that you guys fought for that because the, definitely the impact would have not been the same and you would have not paid the road that you paid for TV and movies and Marvel in the future, definitely. Part of the decision, which I, I understand with the idea of the heroic sacrifice, was that the, these are people in colorful costumes, but this isn't play acting. There are consequences, mistakes are very high. If you didn't have that, it would have, it would have become a very different show, a very different experience. The catch is, Morph is dead. We've mourned his loss. He is gone. The first season, first season. is over. First season is over. Then, the, then we get a call as we're writing the second season. Oh, we get oh, a call no. <laughs> from the network people saying, "Sydney, I want her." Guess what? They asked a, a room full of nine-year-olds who their first favorite character was this first season, and Morph won by a landslide. So the network people have been so supportive of us and given us <laughs> all this. Said, "Look, please, please, can you bring Morph back? Just, you know, just." for the sake of the fans. So we didn't want to, but then when we started, it actually worked out to be some uh, some very good stories with him as a as a damaged character rather than a dead character. Who, but yeah. but we had intended for him to be really dead. Really 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 had intended. Yeah. So so there you go. Yeah. Yeah. But. I think that, that make the consequences feel so much real and I think it gave uh, because we didn't have death in, 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 in these kind of TV shows. So it was like a wild thing to do. And I'm, I'm happy that it was the tone that was set. I'll say this, though. Um, we've heard the story. We did not go to the voice talent sessions that oh. were recording up in Toronto. All the voice talent was in Toronto, which has a very deep theater tradition. So you got these great voices, including John Colicos. <laughs> the fella. The poor guy who did more. <laughs> Ron Rubin, very talented guy, got tasked as Morph. And it's like, oh, it's a 13 episode animated program. Yay! All of the other cast members, all of his friends get 13 paychecks. And oh, he man. looks at the script <laughs> and it says, and Morph dies. Oh, oh no. I get one story. <laughs> and so he wasn't, he wasn't, he was happy uh, a year later when Morph was brought back. But for a while there, he was not a very happy man. Yeah. All right. That's so amazing to hear those stories. Wow, wow, you know what? That's it. Wow, mega wow. Definitely. <laughs> and I love those kind of stories. It's really amazing. Thrilled to share. Delighted to share. This one's for you, Morph. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go with the next question for for tonight. It's says which character and episode were the hardest to work on episodes such as night of the sentinels days of future past the saga of the phoenix savage land the dark phoenix beyond good and evil among others which one was the hardest to work on i'm going to jump in and say one of the easier ones from your standpoint was it the the, the phoenix saga ironically with the dark phoenix like well what well, okay for yeah the the one i think the I'm most proud of the Phoenix saga is there's five parts and each one had to be a, its own story right uh, that kind of ended but then led into the next one and so that five parter was a hundred and ten minutes so it's like a feature movie um normally I got to write with who I mean, we would just hand out assignments as quickly as we could because we had very short schedule mm -hmm. but when that was assigned, we had some extra time. We had a few extra months before the new uh, time was started. So I was able to just call them and say, look, can I just do this, these five stories all 
with the same writing team, with Mark and Michael Edens, my friends from college. So that was a really satisfying uh, story, even though it was five parts and it was very long. Um, it wasn't as hard. Some of them, uh, one man's work, time travel stories drive people crazy because you, there's no real way to make the logic fit completely. If you go back, oh, this changes, but then if this changes and it gets people who are giving you notes crazy. And the one I mentioned, <laughs> One Man's Worth, that took, usually took us about three months to go from, okay, the stories, this is the story we're gonna do to a, a premise and outline, a couple of drafts of the script and mm -hmm. we're done and get everybody's notes in from all over, from Marvel, from everyone. This it took almost a year. I forgot that, yeah. And it kept on going back and forth and back and forth and we get just about get it set and then someone would say, oh, no, it doesn't make any sense anymore. You, you've redoubled the time travel one time too many. Mm -hmm. So time tra we did four or five time travel stories, and they were always the biggest fights. But, but one man's worth, that's right. You you went through the old files we have, still it keep the paper took, files. It took and forever. And it was stacked, the, yeah. the, the notes so, back and forth. You're right, a year, a year. to. to so so that, was, that was the... That was that, those were the hardest ones for me. I don't know if, of, your, of your couple that you wrote, which was harder. Oh gosh, no! But just sort of the the, the scary part. We talked about things being sent overseas to be animated and then brought back. Um, the show was scheduled to premiere in September of 1992, which is a very short window from yeah. the actual you sitting down and coming up with stuff. To the animation, to the so, yeah, over. Yeah, they underestimated how much money and how much time and how much animation. It was a very ambitious uh, sh show to produce. And everybody at every level, both the network and the animation house who bid on it and everyone said, oh, yeah, we can get that done by September. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And everyone worked overtime and still they weren't ready when okay. September came, it just wasn't. And we had, we went through a couple different casts early on. So that put us about, back about a month. There were just things in a new show that took some getting on. Uh, so that's why, I don't know if you, how young you were, but it wasn't shown in September when most everything else premiered. It was held till January before the full season started. And there were two, um, two sneak previews, one in Halloween, one on Thanksgiving uh, of the of Night of the Sentinels because nothing else was ready. Yeah, well, and, I and, read a little bit about that. Yeah. And Margaret Lesh had had been had the, the the courage to allow sequential storytelling, like the first two episodes will lead into the third episode and the fourth episode, you know, and and each one builds on it. Yeah. But for Night of the Sentinels and episodes three and four, Enter Magneto. You, you can't play those out of order. Yeah. So, the, so uh, I think episode three came back and it was very bad. They uh, needed to take a month to fix it. Yeah. And so, so they couldn't, you couldn't, even if four and five were looking good, you couldn't show four and five because three wasn't ready. So she that, had the courage. She had the courage to tell all the advertisers and all the TV stations that were running the show, sorry, it's not going to be September. It's going to be four months late. But here's Because we'll it's going to be right. We're, we're going to make it right. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a special event for the showing of a sneak of this. And that's how the Halloween episode happened. And then the next one in November. Yeah. And then that's amazingly, uh, that, that sort of wet the audience. Yeah, appetite. So I got the fans excited. And so screwing up and being late with the show actually ended up helping make it a big hit, which is People just were hyped. on our part. People were hyped. There was nothing like it back then. Um, yeah. And then I thought um, you earlier mentioned if you don't know you didn't know my age, but back in 1992, um, I was probably about four years old. <laughs> so I did watch reruns eventually back in yeah. Puerto Rico, and they had a very very good Spanish dub. Yeah. Oh, good, good. I was yes. in my teens in the 92s. Uh, I was uh, 14, 15 years old uh -huh. for that time. Again, yeah, both really, both really good show. Yes, oh, great. Again, like like you were saying earlier, it cap it's universal. It captures everyone. Doesn't matter if you're younger, or older, and it has so much depth in it. It's... <laughs> 
Uh, it's really, really great show. So, Gabby, let's go with the next question yes. of the night. Okay, so um, I referenced this earlier, but um, how do you feel uh, about the fact that your work helped pave the way, open the way for X-Men and the MCU movies and all of this glory that we've been getting for the last oof, decades? It's, it's, decades? It's, it's surreal. It's, it's very strange because when we were young, there really wasn't a geek popular culture. No. There were people that were geeks, you know, a few quiet ones that wouldn't <laughs> say it out loud that might like science, fic science fiction or might collect comic books. But 95% of the main pop culture was not that, was not comics, was not science fiction, was not this old entire geek world that, yeah. that was not superheroes. And so going from 1992 when there were no Marvel movies, had been no Marvel oh. movies, to now it's like it's taken over world culture and half of the mo half of the biggest movies in history have been comic book movies it's just it's it's, I'll, it's crazy to us he keeps hearing <laughs> me say this but but i'll say it you you had 30 when you got the job there were 30 years of x-men comic books there was this huge foundation of, of of great storytelling when you got tapped and then here we are 30 years later, there continues to be, you know, great X-Men comic books. But X-Men, the animated series, I will take it with me, became the bridge for a wider audience for those kinds of stories that even though Marvel went bankrupt. Uh, in the middle of it. In the middle of it, which again, how did that happen? But it paved the way, it created an audience, it opened a door so that when Marvel decided to go forward with an X-Men movie which i guarantee would not have happened if there hadn't been some success with the animated series yes definitely. that then the success of that then opened the door for marvel to have its marvel cinematic universe iron man and all the rest you got iron man you got thor you got the you got the world now because yes. of the opera the audience thank you okay good <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you <laughs> I, I i truly believe that that animated series played a critical role in, 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 in and, and, and sh showing Hollywood that super you could you could do TV and movies with superheroes yes. mm -hmm. and that that there is a wide audience to accept it yeah and we are so glad that you respected the source material and you did masterful writing and it's all perfect <laughs> thank you really, I, you guys did a great job with this animated series you really were able to captivate the hearts of the young ones and of course the grown-ups want parents and stuff because they were really really great stories really awesome stories and to be honest we still love it we still <laughs> love it yeah i started re-watching it on disney plus and i'm not stopping <laughs> yeah we we it's it's funny that it's so gratifying that it's lasted yes. because we look back at other stuff we've we've written and oh it was fun then it just it seems kind of dated or you know it doesn't have the pace maybe that and we were anxious to make x-men so fast paced uh and intense and dramatic that in looking back it, it doesn't feel old it doesn't feel a antique the way a lot of shows from back then did and we're just we're we're thankful for that i mean we did that partly because yes. we didn't have big animation mm -hmm. budgets to make it beautiful but we could make it intense you know we could make it go very fast it holds up it holds up the test of time yeah. definitely in fact seeing it as an adult seeing it now again i can appreciate it even more like the the, the depth to it it was ahead of its time it was so ahead of its time that um, now that I'm seeing it, I can appreciate um, how big of, of, of a thing it was really back then. If I can find it on DVD, I would buy it because definitely I would like to have that in my collection. It took us independently years to find all five seasons because they never released a box set here in, in the US. And we folks over in England got a 
box set. Yeah, we never yeah. got a box set, and there's been no Blu-ray. There's been no high resolution release. I, I would love that. I would love that. Yeah, I think part of it was it was Marvel was such a small company back then, uh, and Fox was a brand new TV network here that, that was just getting started, and so it was kind of a like a garage band. It was kind of a patched together quiz mm -hmm. show, and once it was done, all these people were suddenly successful. They were making money, but there wasn't an old, a, a, bi a, a big place like Disney or Universal or Warner's right. to say, "Ah, oh, here, here's something that we could make money off of for decades if we invest in it and and make DVD uh, sets and do this and merch. so there wasn't a a big corporation behind it pushing it. They just enjoyed it while it's down the air and then it was gone and there were new people at fox it wasn't margaret anymore so and now different people have bought different people finally disney bought you know got marvel and, and fox yeah. and all the rights are together and disney looks and says aha here's something that was in a huge hit and let's merchandise and let's make a new series etc so they find they've got it and i think in the next 10 years, there'll be more attention to it than, say, the previous 10 years. But well, if they want any extras for the DVDs, we stand ready. Yes. So whoever's our, in charge. With the <laughs> books like we have in the background. Yeah. This was when we, when I started writing this book in 2015, yep. uh, uh, the rights were scattered among different people. Marvel wasn't interested. Uh, and so now it's grown to where everybody realized then they realized what it, oh this could be a big thing and so they gave us they put the money into making this book and so yeah we just we have big hopes but seven years ago when they started the first book there was not a lot of attention <laughs> couldn't get calls returned <laughs> yeah none, none of the companies had all the rights so but first one's an oral history second one is a deep dive into the art of the series so. yeah that sounds amazing. That sounds so good. All right. Amazing, amazing. So, Vengadores y Vengadoras, stay tuned because Badash and Geek will be back after this message. Vengadores y Vengadoras, 
y bienvenidos a su canal de la cultura pop, Malasium Geek, el mundo para los geeks. Les saluda a su amiga Pika Eni y estamos en todas nuestras redes sociales. Sayonara. And we're back to Malasium Geek with this epic interview that we're doing to Eric and Julia Liwo who brought us a great story in X-Men, the animated series from the 90s, which is, I can, I need to see it again. It's really, really awesome, guys. Really, really awesome. Best time of my childhood, teen, well, teen times. I was a teenager for that time. Um, really, really amazing. Yeah, for me, it, it, was, it was, I was a little younger, but still I would appreciate We had this thing called Telecomicas, and I would catch everything there. X-Men, uh, the Gargoyles. Yes. They also had a magnificent Spanish dub. Very good. Yes, we, we got in on the end of that. Uh, a friend of ours at Disney named uh, Greg Wiseman did uh, Gargoyles, did the first 65, the one, the original show. And once he left, And uh, we were all freelancers. For whatever reason, Disney decided to do a, a, a separate, like a spinoff from Gargoyles, a, a, a kind of a, a follow-up when they moved to New York City. So, and they asked me to supervise the writing, and Julie wrote a couple. Mm -hmm. So we got to we got to learn this whole this whole universe. But that was very much the the, the brainchild and the, the baby of uh, a gentleman named Greg Wiseman mm -hmm. at Disney and an old friend. Oh man, so many stories. It's all, it's all as, as, as a lover of, 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 of all these shows, as, an, as a writer, it's just inspiring to hear all of this. <laughs> and then, um, so Eric and, 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 Ju and Julia, could we talk a little bit about your website and, and social media for any fans that might be tuning into the show just now? I think we found each other um, through, uh, was it Instagram or Twitter that uh, we, we, you first reached out to us? Because we are on, and it's me spending way too much time every day, but X-Men TAS, which stands for X-Men, the animated series. That was a distinction we made early on just so folks would know what we were talking about. So X-Men TAS, that gives us, you got your .com, which is our website. You've got uh, X-Men TAS on Facebook. You've got it on, um, on Twitter, where I spend way too much time, uh, Instagram, and uh, just trying to answer questions or, or be fun and silly or just remind folks you know, about the show and, and some of the behind the scenes stuff that we can share. Uh, the last... It, we had really, the book, our second book came out in um, October 2020, and we've just not had the opportunity to go out and, and, and share with fans at conventions and fests. We are hoping that that's going to ramp up as, as, um, as the summer gets rolling. So we, we have a wonderful time visiting with folks when we can. So that's, please look for us, X-Men TAS, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and our website. Yeah, and if and if anybody's interested in the book, obviously they can get it at their local, you know, support your local bookstore. We hope yes. The for the certainly the art book would probably be available there. The other one's a little harder, the older one's a little harder to find. Um, we if through our website, uh, we can sell them to people directly and in which case if we did, we would obviously it'd be a signed copy. We'd, we'd sign the book before we mailed it out, but we were able to, we always have a, a stock of them. <laughs> and if some, so if someone contacts us through the website or through uh, uh, Twitter. Oh, our email address, yes. by the way, if, um, it, we are X-Men TAS 92 at gmail.com. And that should be on our, our X-Men page, but X-Men TAS 92 at gmail.com. We can arrange with you. It, I, it's cheaper on Amazon, let's just be honest, if you go that route. But um, if, if you'd like a, a signed copy, we can, we can arrange that with you directly if you care to reach out to us on email. That sounds good. That sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and share the website and the email in the comments okay. so everybody has access to that. Thank you, right. Vicky. 
So while Vicky is preparing that for the people to have access, so we're going to go with the next question of the night. And since the beginning of Marvel's live action movies in the cinema in the last 20 years, which movie would you have loved to work on and why? Oh, <laughs> oh. oh. let's see. Uh, I'd lo love to have worked on the first Iron Man because it just, I remember seeing it in theater saying, ah, oh, they're having fun. They're having fun with this, but they're being serious. And so they caught, I think they caught the balance there for mm -hmm. Tony Stark. They and and made hit made him a serious character, a dramatic character, but a fun character at the same time. And whoever was behind it, I think from John Favreau down, they got it. Um I was I was very taken with the the, the movie Logan. Uh, where that's when, what when, I was gonna say, Logan. Yeah, where Wolverine and Xavier were 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 old and they had been superheroes and they were failing and and uh just just a, a little anecdote there a good friend of ours named len ween was wonderful animation uh uh they said i've been a major a comic book writer major comic book writer who created co-created wolverine with the artist dave cockrum created storm created colossus created nightcrawler created all swamp thing all these characters when he's when he was working as a comic book writer at marvel in new york city in new york city back in the 70s but we got to know him during the run of the show because he ended up doing four four stories for us he had moved out to los angeles we didn't know yeah but we got to <laughs> no meet, internet yeah but we got to meet him and he passed recently, but he was able to see the movie Logan before he passed, and he, he was really touched by it that wow. they that they'd done that that they'd done that much humanizing to Wolverine, and he yeah. was he was he was very pleased. And Len Len Wein also wrote for X Men the animated series uh, in the final season, an episode he wrote uh, called Old Soldiers, where it's a little going back in time with Wolverine and Captain America, and it's weird. You can look at Spider Man and. Spider-Man was a the, the Spider-Man animated series was somehow able to get permission to use the X-Men in a, spy, a couple Spider-Man episodes. X-Men couldn't get permission to use Spider-Man. I don't know there why. Were, there were legal issues at the yeah. time. It's odd now. You think Marvel Universe wants ev everybody to be everywhere and and overlapping, and but, but at the time we were just told no, we can't we can't use anybody but the X-Men that you've been told about. But Len actually called up Marvel and said. Look, I want to do one more story for the series, but I want to use Captain America. Can, no one could get the rights. Can you make it happen? So, so a comic book writer got Marvel to get the lawyers together and made it possible for us to use Captain America in that. Oh episode. man, I love that. Amazing, amazing. The cameos, the also the cameos is something I appreciate a lot, and how you guys you got away by <laughs> not yeah. being too specific. That is insane. Yeah. But all credit to the artist side of that, especially uh, Larry Houston, who was, he knew the X-Men chapter and verse. You went in cold, yeah. I didn't know, but he grew up on the X-Men. So when he was tapped to be on the art side, he thought, well, heck, you know, I'll, I'll use he, the Marvel characters. Having so much fun and <laughs> yeah, just but, having to be so quiet about it. But he it. got his hand slapped. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, he, said, he got his hand slapped once when he actually used someone's name. But you're right. He was very, he was careful. And looking back, even though he didn't have the rights to use 30 or 40 of those cameos that you saw. Yeah. Uh, uh, it made the fans happy. It mm -hmm. made, it just gave them it something did. so satisfying. Yeah. And if I were, you know, a corporate president, you'd think I could look back and smile and say, you know, he wasn't supposed to do that, but I'm happy he did that. <laughs> uh, I like Spider-Man under credits being called Web Mutant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Also, is it uh, Thor shows up? Is it no Norse mutant with hammer? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Somehow that got past legal. Like, okay. All right. Norse guy with hammer. <laughs> yeah. Those those moments. Were wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. So, Vicky, let's go with the next question. Oh, yes. So, have you ever worked on any other movies or TV series that you want to point out to? Oh, oh well. Um, Heck, um, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna uh take a, a live action bow here. Just, yeah, <laughs> we got to work for, with with Sam Raimi now everywhere, thanks to his work on um, 
Masters um, Doctor Strange into the multiverse of madness, we got to work for Sam Raimi's company for a glorious season of 50 episodes on Young Hercules, which was part of the Hercules and Xena universe with an incredibly young Ryan Gosling playing Hercules. He and was that 17 was, he when was he 17. started. And it was, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. It's not easy to find, but he got, even then he had it. You go that, you know, he was skinny, he was slender, but he had it. So, yeah. And, and that was, that was interesting because it was, it was different for us writing for live action. It was in a way easier because the short scripts are much shorter, mm -hmm. all sorts of detail that we put into the action in an animated script like X-Men, they said, oh, leave this to the director. So it would be more like, you know, you, you get the characters into a scene, you say kind of what they're doing and what the dialogue is, and the director does much more of the staging. Obviously, the director's in animation as well, but we put a lot more detail in the animated shows. Uh, because you're handing it off to a lot of people who have to you know, visualize what but, it is you're trying but to accomplish. Doing, doing 50 Hercules stories for, for Ryan. And to give the kid credit, he was 17, 18. He shot them all in about seven months. Yeah, it was he crazy. He shot 50 mm. episodes in seven months and, and carried the TV show, carried yeah. the show. Mm -hmm. So so that was, that was a wonderful experience. Yeah. We have had... Um, a, like you said, we've every show we've worked on, we've tried our darndest. You know, uh, doesn't always mean every every series hits or every episode hits, but we have yeah. looked back with pride on things. You are an Emmy nominated writer. Oh yeah, guy. Of, of all things, for doing a TV movie, uh, a Madeline TV movie, <laughs> which was kind of a, a sweet story. Little uh, Madeline and Paris girl. Yeah. So and, <laughs> a range here. We have a range. And, and yeah, I, I I liked writing Winnie the Pooh when we were oh, at, at Disney. That they, was those the best. Fun, fun characters mm -hmm. of all things. The, there's a show called Mummies Alive that we did for for Deke. Uh -huh. The 40, 40 episodes action show after X after X Men. That uh, good looking show. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. beautiful. And, and so there been there a number that were very satisfying. And some were fun at times. I mean, you know, Beetlejuice was great fun. I mean, it was just guys be wild and crazy, and and there's <laughs> obviously a whole lot of humor in there that we didn't get. A, you don't get a chance to do in a show like X Men. Um, but just, we've we've had some real good, really solid special shows opportunities. Uh, that 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 show Exo Squad for Universal. That was again. That was a very uh, more adult animation that we did around the time of X Men. And it's just Universal was having troubles, business troubles, and that they almost didn't show it much. You know, it showed at four in the morning and didn't get this. They didn't have Fox's distribution all over the world. So not many people saw it. But a lot of the same creative people, writers and artists that did X-Men, did Exo Squad. And it's a different, it's a it's a little more, it's not superheroes, it's it's science fiction in the future. Um, uh, more of an action show, like a, a interplanetary war, people from Mars and Venus fighting each it's other in, in space battles. And so it's it's a very different kind of show that people haven't seen much, but we're very proud of that as well. And I, I got to shout it out, Chippendale's Rescue Rangers, the first show I ever got to write for. Uh, now that Chippendale's Rescue Rangers, the movie is now on Disney+, Plus. I it was a hoot! I so enjoyed watching that. It was just fun to have been a part of anything that ended up yeah. In, that, in that story. And out of the 65 F, she wrote 14. She wrote more than anybody. <laughs> next, per, next person wrote nine. So she wrote, she has the she I, has the record for Chippendale. I have serious affection for those little chipmunks, yes. I'm a huge sci-fi geek. So when I saw I'm, I'm looking at Exo Squad and it's on on mm -hmm. uh, it's on one of the streaming services, it looks amazing. If you well, get well, a chance, give it a shot. It's, give, I mean, give it a, it's a shot. Good show. I want, yes. Definitely have to give it a chance because uh, what you said about the description you gave, it sounded, it sounded cool. It sounded the really challenge cool. was distribution. Yeah. Universal Studios at that time didn't have a distribution window the same way like Fox Kids with Marvel had a window to, to distribute. A good to place to there. place right. it. And so, so, yes. so the, yeah, so yeah. it was didn't get seen much, but yeah, yeah please give it, a shot. Give, give it a try. <laughs> All right, I remember Chip and Dale, and I love those characters' voices. I really love Chip and Dale's voices. And oh my God, how much I used to laugh with Dale. <laughs> it was the funniest of both of them. 
All right, so let's go with the next question that I'm sure most fans would like to hear about it. And is, have you met or worked with Stanley? How was your experience with him? Yeah, yeah. Uh, on a few, we have, we on, have. on a few things. First, first, first and foremost on X Men, mm -hmm. and then uh, when there were two other times that we worked with him. One was uh, I was working at Deek D I C Entertainment, where we did Mummies Alive and Mad Line and Inspector Gadget, those kind of things. Oh, and man. Stan was there for a year developing series for the company, and I would. Uh, you know, write them up or come up, you know, uh, he'd have ideas and I'd do the scripts. Also, when he had a, he had a Stan Lee media uh, website right. early on. Very early in the internet. Age. Yeah. He hired the supervising producer of X-Men, Will Minio, to be his main development guy for that. And he and Will hired me to write up a couple things, something called the Seventh Portal. That are, again, these things didn't come to fruition, didn't become hit shows, but in each of the cases, you know, I got a chance to work with Stan on all these. And Stan was, I mean, obviously he's, he's 30 years older than I am, uh, or no, sorry, 33, 34, <laughs> anyway, an older generation, my father's age, but he was, he was, very focused and very full of energy even yes. at the time you know i was in my 30s he was in his 60s he was almost 70. and we go to these meetings and you could tell he was a story guy because everybody other people were worrying about budgets and schedules and he was just focused on you know, what about you know what about this guy you know what's happening with him in this story and it was fun watching him do that and one thing we shared uh uh was he hated being late, being tardy to, any, to, to anything. There was a meeting at 11.30. He was always there at 11.20. And I never wanted to be late either. In Hollywood, there, there can be kind of a, a one-upsmanship. If there's seven people meeting for a meeting, the person that thinks of the, you know, the most special tends to wait, ten, be 10 or 15 minutes late and make everybody else wait for them. And Stan hated that. He just said, look, I've got stuff to do. You know, I'm here, I'm ready. You know, what's with these people? And so we would find ourselves often, you know, in a waiting room with the other five or six people who hadn't shown up yet, bemoaning the fact that we were always on time and the other people weren't. That's really, really amazing story. We have a friend here from Mexico. His name is Pablo. And he says, I met him and he has quite a presence and really he has an awesome story to share with you guys about stanley oh so so maybe well, he after the questions after the interview he will be joining us and he will talk about it to you guys All right so Nikki, let's um, go with the next yeah. question Let's talk about the books real quick. Uh, what can the fans expect from the books you have published? Uh, we have previously on X Men, yeah. uh, yeah. making of the animated series, and X Men, the art and making of the animated series. Yeah. Well, the first one was, a, as I say, a verbal history. It, it goes with me from kind of my point of view from the very first day when we get hired to do the show, all of the ups and downs, all of the the crises and all of the and then uh, of of, hold, of making the show work and then has each has interviews with 37 people involved in making it artists cast members uh writers uh executives everybody that had a hand you know, the the composer uh the, the censor lady len ween yeah yeah one the, of his last yeah. interviews in and book. so i interviewed everybody i possibly could that had a hand in making the show and then tied it all together and showed it beginning to end for the five years that we did it. So that was basically done. You can see it's very dense with, with right. it's just, it's, it's all history and all people talking and, and remembering and how, you know, wonderful they thought it was and it, that it was their favorite show and why. And there's very, there's very little images, just enough images to say a few storyboard images, because when we did this, I didn't really have the rights to use the artwork. So this was this was about as much. 
But then when this was successful, Marvel called and said, look, we just got all the rights back to the show. We all love the book that you wrote, but now that we've got the rights to the show, let's do one showcasing all the art that you couldn't show in the first book. So this, there's much less writing in, in the art book, but, but it's, you can see that we, it's, it's got like a thousand images, things like this hand painted cells from the making oh, of the show man. to, to Sorry, I'm being awkward here. to right. des the designs about every single episode, the, the, the character designs are in there. Same thing with this book. Every single episode, I gave it a page or two talking about what I liked about it, what went right, what problems we had with it, what maybe was a disappointment. And in this one, as I say, it's got original art from Larry Houston and Rick Hoberg on the front and on the back. Yeah. And, and so this this one more inside. Yeah. So this really showcases more of the people that how it was put together 30 years ago, how you made an ambitious animated series, yeah. why it would take nine or 10 months from the idea, from the time an idea was okay till the time you saw the final episode, all the stuff that went into it. Uh, season two, the, uh, the, the wedding opener on that, there's yes. your, there's your bra, there's your evil morph, if you want to call him that. But also you can see Dr. Strange and J. Jonah Jameson are guests at the wedding. <laughs> J. Jonah Jameson, oh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Strange actually makes four cameo appearances in the whole, in the series run. We didn't know that until we started putting this so, book together. <laughs> so I think if you're a super fan, this book's great because you already love the show and you want to find out lots and lots of personal details about what went on. Mm -hmm. If if you just kind of like the show a little, have heard about it, or are interested in animation in general, the one with all the artwork is, is more accessible. It's it's more like you, know, you wouldn't have to have been a crazed fan to appreciate how beautiful the art is and all the effort that went into I mean, look at look at that. That's like a triple uh, cell. cell. That's a background for one of the space fights with the, the Shi'ar. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. it's just it's they're they're they complement each other. They're different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just got this hot on the mail like today. Oh. So I'm really looking forward to reading it. We yeah. hope you enjoy it. Please enjoy. Yeah. We'll do. We'll do. We'll make sure. Yeah. Oh, and the cover there. Will Minio, who was again was the supervising original supervising producer over the whole show, and a wonderful artist, he designed that cover, mm -hmm. the that uh, uh, Cyclops Wolverine crossing cover, uh, originally for that book. As, as yeah, just a... and on the back, what you're seeing here is one of the very first pieces of promotional art that was created for X Men the animated series. This was made by the great Neil Adams, who sadly passed away recently. But if you're a super fan, if you look at this piece, you probably saw it back then. But you note, if you look, um, it's missing some people. And this was oh, yes. at the very first time they didn't know who the team was going to be. For sure. For sure. And they and they decided that you know maybe Beast and Jean Grey might be secondary characters, and that's why they're not on there. Uh, nor is Gambit. Nor is Gambit. The so so they were still we were still figuring out as we were writing the initial stories what the final team was going to be and so they had this this uh promotional art out right at the very like the first week mm -hmm. and that that's why it's missing a couple three of the characters fun behind the scenes moment yeah. so let's go to the last question for the moment right and the last question says and finally tell us without many spoilers about your new book X-Men, the art and making of the animated series. Yeah. And for both books, how the public can obtain the books in discussion? Okay. Both both of them are available on Amazon. That's easy. Uh, the the new art book is available at big bookstores. But the Barnes and Noble has it in stock. Yeah, and yeah. hopefully your local comic book shop. We, pre we encourage folks to shop locally if you can. Yeah, they're each could be available. Uh, the, the first book is available from the publisher called Jacobs Brown. Uh, you could, if through our through our contacts, as I say, you can contact us, and we take PayPal or whatever. We can we can mail you uh, a a signed book. Uh, it, it costs a little more because it costs us to package it, mail it, and whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll get we'll get you a signed copy. But uh, you know, obviously, Amazon's the easy way. Right, and we yeah. for both. So books. please, you know, if you're a fan, we really 
we like to think that the book, both books together, really um, tell a story that hadn't been, there had been no other people telling the story before. Oh my gosh, I love that. I got, okay, I got a, I got a little tidbit here yeah. as you're turning the pages on the art book there. So the, this, the back at the, the, yeah, the front and the back are original store are the storyboards for the opening sequence of the animated series from Larry Houston when he drafted it. If you think you've seen the series all your life, take a look here at Gambit when he's the close up of Gambit's cards. Just look, think at the moment in the beginning when he's when first time you see Gambit, boom, and he's throwing the cards. Okay, may not you, I bet you never noticed it, but if you look, look at the ace of spades, it's the spade is upside down. And I had never caught that. And I said to Larry, wait a second, um, was this an error in overseas animation? Because it goes by so fast, I never caught it. And he said, oh, you know, I'll double check, that makes sense. And he came back and said, oh my God, I drew it wrong. <laughs> so Larry Houston drew the Ace of Spades upside down, made it through production. And that's been in the opening sequence you've seen your entire life. It's still there. It's still there. And if you know, look for it real fast, you can catch it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's really amazing. Oh, maybe I'll think I order you guys directly the book so I can have it with the autograph. There you go. Happy to do it. Proud to do it. Yeah, so before we go to our last promotional break and end in our program, we, but as you did, are giving the opportunity to a great fan and follower, which I mentioned him earlier. Yes. He's mm -hmm. from the channel of Geek Blue Review, he's a huge fan of X-Men and of Marvel Universe. So I'm going to introduce you guys from Mexico, Pablo Garcini. Hello, Pablo. Hello. Hi, guys. How are you? Very <laughs> good. No, oh, uh, nice. The background, yes. Good. Very nice. Yeah, it, good it's, it's only fitting because we have... Uh, animation royalty in the house. Who? Who? Well, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you totally are. You are so modest. But uh, when we were kids, like you were saying earlier, that we were very uh, younger. Uh, I was like 12 or 11 years old when Perfect. this TV show uh, came out. So it is, first of all, it's an honor to meet you. Uh, thank you for everything that you have ever done for for the for the X Men community, and uh, well, um, you have uh, produced one of the biggest shows ever. So, um, did you ever think that your show would produce so many products, like like you had like the VHSs? Yes, yes, yes yeah. You do. Uh, that that was like pretty much the only way that we fans could watch yeah. the show in the VHS. And depending on where you were in the world, Pizza yeah. Hut ran a promotion where you could get one of the two collectors tape. Oh my God! Yes. To Pizza Hut, yeah, yeah. And that really was the way a lot of folks, because VHS tapes were expensive during that time period. Yeah, and and that was the way to get it to get the show was to get the VHS tape. Yeah. So yeah, we yeah. wish we were talking. We wish there were a Blu-ray. We wish you know release. Maybe there will be. Fingers crossed. One, one day. Yeah. But we're just we're so pleased. It's on Disney now. That, yes. So it can people all over the world can can watch on Disney Definitely. Plus. Mm -hmm. Actually, that was go, what that was going to be one of the, my next questions. Uh, do you think we we are gonna see ever? an HD version of the show, a digital a digital version of the show, because we can see it now in Disney Plus. But uh, some some of us guys will still like to get our things in physical media. Sure. Same here. Yeah, yeah Same we, here. we asked because we have close close friends of yeah. ours. A guy named Alan Burnett was <laughs> was the head was the head guy on Batman. On the original Batman yeah. animated series. And about two years ago, they had a wonderful uh blu-ray set sure. come out it was not cheap but it was, it was the whole the whole se the whole group of all the original batman episodes yeah. remastered oh my god it's a little hard uh i'm not sure what they'll do because the original art is on you know it's 480 you know the, the, i don't know if you know what but they they sold millions of those mm -hmm. yeah, so sure. you think 
you'd think Disney would say, aha, look, it worked for Batman. It'll work even more for X-Men. We, we, we have obviously no connection to their business and marketing people. But occasionally, if we bump in and people ask, we say, please, because between the two books and all of our friends, you know, artists and everyone that are still alive in the cast, mm -hmm. uh, we could give them hours and hours of extras. And we're happy to do it for nothing. No, no, for thousands of dollars. No. We're happy to do it for thousands, thousands of dollars. Yeah, but, <laughs> but happy to do it for a couple of nice sets of Blu-ray. All right, there you go. That's what we'll do it for. That's what we'll do it yeah. for. Yeah. And, sets of Blu -ray. Well, I, I was talking about the collectibles that came out out of the series. Mm -hmm. I had the Panini album that came oh, out. Good. Oh, good Lord. Yeah. The stickers and the books. Yeah. yeah. Yes. yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. We, we, nice. we had some some uh uh valentines oh yeah <laughs> x-men valentines that we could set oh. yeah and yeah. we also had like the mugs yeah oh, and you know, it was, we had yeah. this this amazing collection from uh oh, yeah the, art. Yeah, the is that, is yeah on, that, open yeah, yeah the, this open. is a sealed box and this is like oh, an yeah. special edition team for this series oh Yo, Pablo, that's, and, that and is when crazy. Is your address and when are you away from home so we can sneak in? <laughs> oh, and that's, that's, that's gorgeous. That's nice. that's gorgeous. Nice. No, no, no. Oh, uh, that's that. That was one of the next questions I wanted to ask you. Yeah. Did you ever get something from the show? No. Like like <laughs> emails or or original you know, scripts or something like that? Oh. oh, oh, yes, yeah. We we have all we have all we have almost all the scripts. Uh, on uh, and print out print. and and storyboards mm -hmm. and and old notes. You know, I just kept all we kept all the files above the garage. Yeah, it, uh, so that's just, how we're we getting, got getting very dusty. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one re reason it was it was easier to write the books because <laughs> I had all the old scripts and storyboards, uh, not artwork. The artists kept the you know but, original artwork, but, but we do at the storyboards. But but a lot of that's the sad thing. Uh, there was no centralized storage for the original art cells from okay. back in the day because yeah. and Marvel was being was being picked apart. Uh, so we think if there were a couple million cells painted during yeah. the run of the show, there may be a couple thousand left out there. You know, all the, all the rest are just gone. Yeah, you okay. know, it's, it's thrown in, away. In this series, there was yeah. actually this this trading cards uh -huh. that yeah. came out from the Night of the Sentinels. Oh man, and yeah. This, this Gambit card, I took like 17 years to get because it was so hard. Uh -huh. Good for you, though, for sticking to it. Yeah, the storm pose. Yeah, yeah. Nice. and there, there was the action figures, there was this uh, little mini figures. Yeah. Oh, oh. Figure, uh, I cast Meta. Yeah. I'm getting a couple things. Yeah, she's going to grab a couple. See, we're, we're not at our. We're, we we have a, a X Men background that we yeah. usually work on there, but the the computer over there fritz out. So we're, yeah, yeah. It's 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 like we told we we told people when we're dealing with uh, doing a show. If a show's successful, the merchandise will follow. You don't that's have cool. to. But oh, oh yeah, that's, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Truly amazing. Chef Boyardee X Men pasta. Oh and man! Someone came up with. That's amazing. Bubble bath, which you, <laughs> yeah, you, have very much, you also oh have. God, we have those cards. We like, have those yeah. cards. Yeah. Nice. Card. Oh, man. Nice. When, I, when I was a kid, I felt like Gambit with this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think all of us, were, we were adults and we were throwing cards at things. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I, would, I would toss them on my friends at school. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, what was... Uh, like the inspiration of this show when you were coming up with the new with the new X Men show. This is the Pride of the X. Yeah, yeah. So that's Pride of the X Men. Yeah. A lot of folks on the art side worked on that. Worked on that. And Margaret Lesh. That was that was about that. that was about three years before three mm -hmm. four years before eighty nine. And what it was, they she found some money to make that as to say, look, mm -hmm. uh, we could do an X Men show. Look how wonderful it could be. As a sales tool, mm -hmm. as a promotional to try to, show, to to get a commitment from a network to do a full season, mm -hmm. and we produced it, and the networks didn't like it, 
And so it just, they showed it, you know, once or twice and they put it out on VHS, but, but it was kind of a failed, it was a failed project on theirs from their point of view. But it was, but it, in, in defense of it, it failed because there were a lot of layers above the artists, above the writer, above Margaret, who were requiring them to do things that 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 didn't that didn't make it succeed. Too many cooks. Too many cooks on the top. So when Margaret became president of Fox Kids and 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 was in charge, she'd already gone through this experience. She wasn't going to have people steamroller yeah. the show that she wanted yeah. to make. The she, she, yeah. had. she and the two, the two main artists on that show, Will Minio and Larry mm -hmm. Houston, had been through that. And that wasn't what they had hoped it would be. So this, sure. that when we do our show, they said, you know, this time we're going to do it the way we really wanted to do it. Not the, not that way. That didn't turn out as well as we'd like. This time it's going to be right. So they were, it gave them serious courage sure. to fight with someone who wanted to change their show, and which happens so often. Every one of them from Margaret on down is, there was a point in the making of the show if you don't do it where everyone said i'm doing it this way or you're firing me and sure. and but they had the courage to do that because they'd been through the experience of pride of the x-men and they were not gonna yeah they were not gonna let that happen again so. that actually was one of the questions because uh you got away with with many things in the show yeah you, you talk about very deep uh issues like yes. racism like uh, rejection, like oh. sometimes I saw the show and I thought I was seeing like American History X, like Friends yeah. of Humanity were, were <laughs> very, very bad people. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And we, we're, yep. we're, we're yep. so lucky they, that they let us make this, this show that serious. Yes. Uh, because yes. we all wanted to, the books, at the time in the late in the 70s 80s had some pretty serious stuff in them and so we'd hold those up if someone questioned why can't you make this younger or funnier we said look at the books they're serious they take on serious issues why can't we be at least as serious as the best of the books mm -hmm. so that gave us kind of a back something to to argue with right and it it, it helped it, it it helped us so uh sure. yeah so so, so i'm thrilled i'm thrilled the show played everywhere i'm sure i'm thrilled <laughs> they played Mex mexico for you know yeah it was in mexico they they have video games yeah. <laughs> yes. oh, my God. Yeah, oh yeah oh sure. wow well, this was where, where you should uh, fight juggernaut yeah. oh, God, I, oh I, man I, yeah and uh, we had like this reissue in the Secret Wars. Yeah. Oh, excellent! Yeah. Yep, I understand yeah. they're coming out with a. And it um, was uh, yeah. all inspired in the '92 series. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. What, yeah. what I want. Oh! To, yeah, oh. This this is a book that every X Men fan should have. Like this is a love letter to all the fans of X Men, actually. Uh, the the TV series felt like that, and this this book also feels like that. Oh. Like uh, the stories you come up with, uh, the character sheets, uh, the, the 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 pictures with Chris Claremont. It really it's it's a testament of why it was such a successful show. Yeah. Well, thank you for thank, that. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, 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 really. Uh, and you are, you're, I think sometimes you are being so modest because you touch uh, pretty much all the kids' hearts all over the world. Yeah. Oh, yeah. True. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that, it is humbling. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. It is. Thank oh, you for that. Yeah, yeah oh. really, because usually uh, the, 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 TV, the TV series for kids, they were not like that. They, no. it, you, you started up with a bang with the Night of the Sentinels when you killed most yes. in the first episode. Yeah. And after that, everything was on the table. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. That's exactly how it played. That was the point of that. And, and you showed the, the, the personalities of each one of the characters when, when 
when Wolverine hits Cyclops in in in, in the abs. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you, you, you are a coward. Yeah. And you know, that is the only time anybody hits any we, we had to ask special permission yes. for that. And luckily the sensor lady looked and said, just I understand. Sure. Grieving. He's, Wolverine is feeling grief and anger. And sure. this is not he's not a sadistic man, but he just he can't help himself. He just has he, he that's the only natural reaction. And he doesn't use his claws. And he makes That's a point true. of that. Next time I use the next time I use these, yeah. but it's grief. It's grief he, that he's reacting to. And that was a one wonderful thing they let us do. It's part of the books, but in most animated shows for kids that we work on, the executives above don't understand storytelling very well, and they say, "Why can't everybody all get along and be nice to each other?" Oh, that's not the and as opposed to being human and having real conflicts with your friends, with your family, with a family you might die for, but who you want to strangle at the same time. <laughs> so it's, uh, that's, that makes for good, that allowed us to make for good storytelling because the people above us, the people that hired us understood this about stories and pushed us. Mm -hmm. Like when we did the one with Nightcrawler about, about his religion, about his faith, mm -hmm. Uh, we wonder because it's a look, they don't usually let people do stories about faith on kids' television. <laughs> and uh, our, my I went to my boss and he said, no, push it more. If you're going to have Nightcrawler, that's to the central thing for him, for his character. Yeah. If you're going to have a show about faith, really make it about faith. Don't pussyfoot and do a little bit. Mm -hmm. Really sure. do it. So that was a gift to us to, to get paid and be allowed to write stories that real. That that's what I like about the 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 personal shows like the rogue where she's so she steals the powers from Mrs. Marvel. Yeah. Oh my god. And one yeah. one month's worth and all that stuff. Yeah. Those are the personal things. Like yeah, yeah we can totally relate to them. It, they all have you know bright shiny costumes and have amazing superpowers, but it really comes down to what is the internal issue? What is what is the internal character conflict, and how does that play out? You know, with with the other characters. That's where it's all. That's that's what makes it um, matter to you. And, and what do you think about uh, the movies, especially the ones that touch on the Phoenix Saga? Because you did it perfectly. <laughs> yeah, we that did yeah. so well in the live action thing. Yeah, Pardon me for a it's there in the movies. There's good and bad. We we love the fact they made these huge movies, and the casting in most cases is spectacular. If you had a dream cast of people, you know, for Charles Xavier, for Wolverine, you know, they they did some so so many things so marvelously. Sure. Um, I think they never quite found the Phoenix Saga the way we did. They used the bits of it in one and bits of it somewhere else. It just, I, I, I think that they never quite got a handle on other things they did. They did beautifully, um, but we've had many, many fans tell us, "Thank you for getting it right in the cartoon." We get it that, and it was hard because in the books it's about twelve comic books, and there are lots of even smaller stories and simplifying that story and making that one work it was a real challenge it was uh it wasn't it wasn't easy i'll say that when the phoenix saga and darkening saga when when those when those came up in the in the series run as folks were watching the show when it came out you had two years to to learn these characters to live with them you, you could watch them on vhs tape but they came out once a week you know for however and yeah. So you had a relationship with, with yeah. that. Yeah, so we had an advantage kind of a little over the movie in that you know, the Phoenix Saga is like episodes 31 through 35. Mm -hmm. And you have the audience having watched 30 half hours of these people and really getting to know and love them and then have them go through this versus in the movies, it's kind of like, okay, here's two hours kind of off by itself. But I just, I guess I say, there's some things that they were able to do better than we had the budget for or <laughs> or that they, they, they were able to do more some more adult moments than we mm -hmm. did but there's certain things that just 
the magic came together with our artists or with our cast. I mean, there's some of those moments in those shows you're talking about where the cast chemistry is just wonderful. Sure. And, and they create moments that we just sat back and said, oh, this is so, you know, we, we hoped this would be good. They've made it better yeah. than we even imagined when we wrote it. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were very lucky with that. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, oh, no, I'm, I'm good. You're, you're, you're good? Okay. Yeah, the thing is that you became the standard. So everything that came yeah. after that, like, <clears throat> they, they made yep. it yeah. <laughs> And sometimes uh, it, it felt short. Yeah. Yeah, well. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Pablo. Now, we are going to do a little commercial break. But first, I want to remind our fans that after this break, we're going to give them the chance to ask questions to Eric and Julia. Oh my God, Pablo, please. Pablo, please. <laughs> but remember to the fans, not to make okay. questions about the X-Men 97 due to disclosure agreement. Maybe okay. another time when they got permission from Marvel Studios to talk about him, maybe we could do another interview to talk about him. Of course, when they get the authorization from their big bosses, from Disney and Marvel. Sure. Okay. So, Vengadores y Vengadoras, stay tuned. Because after this commercial, Balas and Geek will continue with this amazing interview. Sama, I'm a variety streamer, teacher, musician, and writer. I mainly stream Smash Brothers and Apex Legends, but I do love indie games. Let's get ready to rumble! Oh, I got him! My goal is to provide an entertaining, interactive, and engaging show. I've been told that my shrimps are very funny and kind of insane. <laughs> Yo aviso, activa la secuencia. Vuestra descarga en esta cosa de la señora. Estamos en línea y listos. Vengadores, vengadoras. 
Te invitamos a que nos visites en todas nuestras redes sociales. Descubre todo lo sensacional de la cultura pop en Bajación Geek. No te arrepentirás porque esto está peposo. Suscríbete, dale me gusta y comparte porque nosotros trabajamos para ti. Este que les habla, Rafista al PR, les espera. Se les quiere mucho, 3000. And we are back to this super epic interview where we are interviewing Eric <laughs> and Julia Riewoldt. We are talking about the X-Men from the 90 series and their books, of course. And now let's give a chance to our fans to make their questions to Eric and Julia. But remember, no questions about the X-Men 97. We don't want them to get in trouble with Marvel. I'm sure I'm sure they're anxious to talk about it, but they got them on a leash. <laughs> so we're gonna pray that Marvel soon says, yes, you can talk about it. So we can make another interview and talk about that new show that's coming up soon. So Marvel, please, please, Marvel, please. <laughs> so let's start with our questions of the night. I'm going to start with my own question. Uh, so Eric and Julia, have you guys get any nomination in your career as writers and showrunners? I'm sorry. Nomination? It, it, it broke up there just a little bit. What was the question again? Awards. You guys got any nomination? I'm sorry. Any awards in your career as writer and showrunners? I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> I got a nomination, an Emmy nomination for uh, a animated TV movie about called uh, uh, about Madeline, the, the 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 French, the young French character. It's animated by Deke. Uh, My Fair Madeline was the name of it. Uh, this is geez, about 20 years ago. Julia actually won an award. <laughs> I'm holding it wrong. There we go. This is not an Emma, but an Emmy, but an Emma, an environmental media, media award. award. There we go. From gee, like 1994. 1994. From... And and she did a, a TV movie, animated movie called Red Planet, a Robert Heinlein story. I I wrote the three parter for that. That uh, was its own mini series, and was honored to receive this about environmental concerns that was nice and also uh on uh goliath the uh, gargoyles of goliath chronicles uh, uh nominated for a media access award for an episode i did on that um yeah. uh, so we yeah. but but yeah don't no no uh so just just those just those couple so if anyone wants to nominate us for anything we're wide open <laughs> I do. Oh, well oh, we yeah. will nominate you guys as an amazing human beings were making the best show that marked our childhood oh, oh. Woo. you guys are really awesome you really marked our childhood our youth time we could identify ourselves with the characters some of the characters of x-men because we could see some real life conflict in a sci-fi series, anime series. So here we got a question from Jeremy, Jeremy Stack. And he asks, what are the showrunners' favorite X-Men? We talked about that a little bit earlier, but uh, it, it, I'm kind of answering the question, but going at it sideways, uh, a lot of people We're wondering why is Jubilee in the series and not Kitty Pry from the original Pride of the X-Men books. And part of that was uh, that Jubilee and Gambit were both newer characters to the Marvel comic books at that time. And with a new show rolling out, they were interested in using those, those characters. Uh, the quick answer for me, my favorite is, is Beast. He's, he's romantic, he's incredibly smart. It felt, I felt smarter writing for him. That was, it, ah, there you go, there yeah. you go. Yeah, and, and we, It's funny when 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 you're trying to imagine them and make the story stronger mm -hmm. and get get the dialogue right for everybody, you kind of have to 
it's like having a large family. It's hard to have a favorite. You have you have to get in, in, into each of their minds or each of their hearts and write and 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 understand all of them. So I like different parts of different ones. I mean, Jubilee being kind of cheeky and <laughs> and, and 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 a little oblivious sometimes. Love love to very fun and obviously Wolverine is such a com compelling character just worldwide forever on the, in the books and the, the show you know, you know what what caused that I mean the guy our friend Len Wein who created him didn't know you know what was it about that there would have been hundreds of X-Men characters and there'd been dozens of major X-Men characters mm -hmm. what was it that made him that much more compelling to the world audience reading the stories or watching the stories on TV or or watching the stories in the movies. Why was he so central? And Len had no idea. It's just, you know, he was asked to come up with half a dozen different new X-Men back in the mid 70s. International X-Men. International X-Men. The first X-Men in the 60s had been American kids, you know, young, you know, teens, and they're all American. So he was, so he got, you know, Colossus was Russian. And uh, Nightcrawler was German, Storm was and from Storm Africa. was from Africa, and so he, the first one he he wrote for this new set of X Men was Wolverine from Canada, and so they wanted people just not from America; they wanted from everywhere, like a United Nations of characters. And I think that helped make the the series more open and uh, and and accessible, but it also it helped us make very distinct characters mm -hmm. in if you look at the six, early 60s uh x-men a lot of the dialogue among the characters is very similar uh you know beasts lines are not much different than 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 uh ice man's lines and are much different than cyclops lines they're not as distinct characters as our older characters that came from different countries with different backgrounds and I think that was a gift to us yeah. that we were given a more diverse set of characters. It made it easier for us to write because if a situation came up, we know oh, only Beast fits in that moment or only Rogue fits in that moment where none of the rest of them do. If the characters are too similar, it's hard for a writer. Who, who do you give the line to? Who do you give the moment to in the scene if they're all the same? So making them as different as we could was very important. Okay, so the, uh, we have another question here. This is from uh, Jason Silsox, and he says, "How did it feel going from not knowing if the show was even to get any pop, was going to get any popularity, to suddenly being incredibly successful?" Well, we we were on, at the first level. We were just so gratified that we knew we had another year's work one more year of work because because ah. we had then two babies yes. <laughs> one and a half and just newborn. newborn and if the show had failed we might have been out of work yeah so that was that was at the basic level at the next level we didn't you know we saw it was successful and that made us feel great because we fought hard for it but we didn't appreciate how big a thing it was becoming worldwide we were in our home office mm -hmm. like this just typing the next story and the next story and the next story and we'd hear oh and we'd see numbers saying oh it's the number one show on kids television well that's wonderful and that that meant that gave us confidence and made us feel proud but until we ended up going to comic book conventions say six seven years ago yeah yeah. and saw this whole sea of people you know dressed as our characters we didn't have a real sense of mm -hmm. how much this had become part of the culture no. we knew the movies were successful we knew the comic you know it, we knew it continued to be to do okay but until you see this this whole culture affected by something that you'd written 25 30 years ago it wasn't real until we saw it, until we started going to the cons and meeting the fans. Yeah. That is amazing. And then, Pikani, do you want to read the next question? Yeah, I'm going to read the next question. Of all the stories told in the X Men animated 
Which one was your spirit? This one is from Alice Vanessa. Oh, I'm gonna. Uh, we we talked about this a little earlier, but I'm gonna I'm gonna shift. My personal favorite for me was the opportunity to write Days of Future Past Part One in the first season, because that was my way into the X Men series as as someone who worked on the show. And there was a certain you ah yeah. youthful naivete in that this is the crown jewels one of the crown jewel stories in in X Men comic books. But you're gonna have to change it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I should have been horrified and terrified. But also credit to um, Bob Skier and Marty Eisenberg who wrote part two of that one. That it was it. Everything was a risk. But you know, writing a two-parter of this particular story with this kind of magnitude. But you can't. Kitty Pride's not even on the scene anymore, and sure. a character that we haven't used before, Bishop, is going to be the one who goes. Oh, la, 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 la. There were there were a lot of balls being juggled in the air for that one but it it, it really seemed to, to to stick its own landing and i'm very proud of that yeah and as i mentioned before one man's worth was a real satisfying one mm -hmm. for me time travel is very difficult <laughs> very <laughs> difficult to write but it, it 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 worked out just the way i hoped and then i see another question over here from oh this is olga <laughs> okay you want to read your own question Uh, Olga, I'm going to read it for you. It looks like you have your mic. Have you felt identified with any of the characters? You know, I think the the amazing thing looking back, and you'll verify this, if you look at the X-Men, at the team, the main team of X-Men, it was half women, half men. And it, it didn't wave any like red flags to draw attention to it. It's just, you had incredibly powerful characters who were women and incredibly powerful characters who were men and they were all working together on, or trying to figure out how to work together on the team. And 30 years ago, that, that was, that was not um, uh, a casual thing to do, to have a character, to have that many, that I hate saying this, to have that many female characters in those positions of power um, on a show that, that, was the one that became X-Men. Um, and I think, honestly, there's a little something in each of the main characters that I think I, because in writing for them, you got to find something to, to connect to if you're writing for the characters. I love me my beast, but I, you know, each of the characters, there's something there that, that, that I felt connected to in, in, in some way that, that was very gratifying. Yeah, so uh, next. And then uh, I see one last question for the night, and I want to I want to say thank you so much for being patient. I know this has been very long, and you guys are very, are, I'm sure, are very tired. I'm sorry. And here's the last question. It says, uh, in the design style of the character, did you, did you get inspired by the art of Jim Lee? Yes. 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 And, uh, and there's a story there. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a wonderful there's a wonderful story there. First of all, the yeah the artists. The in charge of the show, Will Minio and, and and Larry Houston. Really, it's those two guys made almost all the decisions. Mm -hmm. There are other, other wonderful uh, artists that worked with them, like Rick Hoberg. But it basically, it was Will's baby, and Will was the one that was interacting with Marvel. And so, look, we've looked through all the all the various designs because there's so many good artists mm -hmm. that have drawn X Men, a couple dozen. So we looked at them all, and Will had Will had worked at least ten years in animation and knew and knew that the, the requirements of animation. Mm -hmm. It's easy yeah. to draw really complicated uh, comic book art, but if you if you if you move it, you know, if 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 all you do if, if you turn something <laughs> with all the detail in it, you just spent the entire budget drawing all those little lines. Yeah. You needed something that was really clean and simple and simplifiable so that it could work in animation and still look human and still look special. And we'll say, okay, Jim Lee's a, I mean, it does that. It's currently, it's, uh, it was currently popular. So he told uh, Marvel, I said, look, this is the perfect, this is the best for us. You know, I, he had other favorite artists of his own. He said, no, Jim's, Jim's suit us best. They all agreed. Will and the artist spent two months designing the whole world, all the characters, doing the first three or four storyboards. We were all going, 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 going. And thought, oh my God, we're we're still behind schedule, yeah. but this is going to be a good show. Maybe we, 
Maybe we can catch up. Maybe we can stay on schedule. And then he gets a phone call <laughs> saying, oh, you're going to have to throw all that out yep. and start from scratch. We are not going to use Jim Lee. Oh, no. What? Uh, what? Huh? And, he's, and they said, no, you don't understand. It's it's a done deal. We'll come up with something else. You have to start from scratch. Come up with something else. Redesign the entire show. Why? And he said, oh, my God, what is this? I can't stand this. And he said, because he knew in his bones that that was the right way it had to go. He was so frustrated. He didn't call. Luckily, we we're just writing. We didn't have to deal with any of this yeah. crisis. He took it upon himself over the next couple of days to design a really terrible looking group of people that looked like like the worst Hanna-Barbera version, uh, Scooby-Doo version of X-Men that you could ever see. And he sent those in with no comment you know, to, to Marvel, say, okay, here's here's a different look for yeah. you. And they all were, oh my God, oh my God, this is uh, Stan Lee was going, because he didn't warn Stan, he didn't warn anybody, he didn't warn the other artists. And they were calling him and leaving him phone messages. And, well, what have you done? This is, we can't do this show. They got the point. They had decided not to use Jim Lee because Jim had just left Marvel. He, had, he and the other artists had just left to form their own company. And so oh, the people God. at Marvel got together and said, well, we'll we're not going to let this, we're not going to show this guy's work if he's left our company. Forget him. We want something. So they had made a corporate decision yeah. that was going to hurt our show. And Will risked getting fired and I mean, by handing them this awful <laughs> set of designs, which I wish he, I don't think he kept. I he wish he not. had. They're lost. To the They're lost forever. Time. But he honestly but he did. did he did that without warning people. And they kind of, they got it. Okay, we get it. We're being, we're being short-sighted here at Marvel. We will let these people in television continue to use the Jim Lee uh, uh, as, as the basis for the design. But it was, it was a close call yeah. and he could have been fired over that. So, uh, so yeah. yes, yes, Jim Lee, but almost not Jim Lee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. man, that's very nice. good. Okay. Boy, well, I hope that was, a, that was a big enough question to go on. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really yeah. amazing. This young man, Pablo, he really yes. has an awesome collection. Oh, maybe I'm backstage off, off, out of air. He can show you more stuff. It's really, really, really. He has a huge collection about Marvel and X Men. So, first of all, I want to thank all of our fans for their question and for respecting the disclosure. And well. I have to say this, Gigi. You know what, Gigi? What? What? What is a pic uh, picanip? But this show has ended. What a very sad sound when it's over. Okay. Well. It is. It is. Uh, so if you like this show, remember to give us a like. And remember to share with your friends and family so they can enjoy of this great content and if you and haven't subscribed yet so what are you waiting for <laughs> subscribe right now and remember to share this stuff with friends and family guys I thank you everybody who has been here the questions were amazing the participation people were excited and I hope that everybody enjoyed this we I had a great time. Had a great time. We had a great time. Thank you, Eric and Julia. And so, and remember that. Yep. Go ahead, Pablo. Yeah, you should totally get the book. Uh, if you are an X-Men fan, you should do you yourself a service. Get this one because uh, this one, as 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 well as the show, it's uh, a love note for the fans. That's correct. I love those. Yeah. Remember, you can find those books on Amazon and directly with Eric and Julia Leewald on their website and on their Gmail. Well, thank so, you all very much. 
All right, everybody, thank you for watching, and we will see you soon in another episode of Bagasium Geek. This was your friend from always, Kofi, Kani, and... And Gigi Sama from Gigi Teacher 42. Thank you, everybody. And Pablo Garcia from Geek Blue Review. Thank you, guys. So, arigato, vengadores y vengadoras. And remember that Badassum Geek loves you 3,000. Sayonara! <laughs> <laughs>